Thanks for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Lori Johnson. Today, the United Nations finally acknowledging Hamas's brutal sexual assaults against Israeli women during the terrorist attacks on October 7th. And more evidence that United Nations Relief and Workers Agency workers took part in those attacks. Here in the U.S., it's Super Tuesday, the biggest day yet in the 2024 presidential race. We'll look at the importance of today's votes and how the races are shaping up. Actor producer Kirk Cameron on a mission to bring wholesome books to children in public libraries. And you may be surprised to learn what kinds of books are in the libraries now. And a lot of bad news has come out of the southern border region. Now, Franklin Graham is bringing the good news of the gospel to the area. Those stories and more on today's Newswatch. This is CBN Newswatch. We begin with the war in Gaza as a U.N. report is recognizing Israel's claims of brutal sex crimes by Hamas against Israeli women during the terrorist attacks on October 7th. The new report also cites ongoing sexual abuse against hostages in Gaza. Israel is also presenting more evidence that some United Nations Relief and Workers Agency workers took part in the terrorist strikes, releasing a shocking audio tape to the public. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl brings us the story from Jerusalem. Israel's foreign ministry welcomed the U.N. report acknowledging that Hamas and other terrorist groups committed sex crimes on October 7th. The U.N. also recognizes that the crimes were committed simultaneously in different locations and point to a pattern of rape, torture and sexual abuse. The report also acknowledges the existence of ongoing sexual crimes against the Israeli women and men being held hostage by Hamas and calls for the immediate release of the hostages. Israel's ambassador to the UN, Gilad Erdan, called on the Secretary General and Security Council to condemn Hamas. Earlier, he challenged the international body to take action. In the future, you won't be able to claim that you didn't know, just as the world claimed after the Holocaust, that you were not exposed to the suffering and horrors. Those who remain indifferent are complicit in the crimes themselves. Erdan played testimonies of women brutalized by Hamas, charging the UN with apathy and indifference. She went into the shower, and while she was there, one of the terrorists went inside, took his clothes off, with a gun towards her head, told her to do everything that he wanted. The IDF also declassified a call. It called an intercept of a Hamas terrorist who is also an UNRWA-employed school teacher in Gaza. The terrorist is heard speaking on the phone roughly seven hours after Hamas began invading Israel. On the call, you can hear him bragging about Sabaya. Sabaya is a female captive that he got on his hands. I'm a father of two girls. When I hear this conversation, I tremble. It's horrific. In the U.S., the State Department defended Vice President Harris's meeting with War Cabinet Minister Benny Gantz over the objections of Prime Minister Netanyahu. He has a critical voice in the delivery of humanitarian assistance. He's an important figure in the sitting government of Israel, and so that's why we engage with him. Meanwhile, Hezbollah unleashed a barrage of rockets at northern Israeli border communities on Tuesday morning. Israeli fighter jets responded by striking Hezbollah terror targets. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Our CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell is with us now from Jerusalem. Chris, there's been a talk of an attempt at a diplomatic solution to the conflict between Israel and Hezbollah. Does that seem realistic? <laughs> Laurie, it really doesn't, and here's why. It's been 18 years since uh, Resolution 1701, uh, 2006, during the Second Lebanon War. The idea behind that resolution was that they would demilitarize that region from the border of Lebanon and Israel up to the Latani River, about 18 miles. 
Instead, Hezbollah, that has been controlled area zone, only goes stronger. They're actually more powerful than the Lebanese army. And this part of this uh, diplomatic effort is to make sure that the Lebanese army really takes care of Hezbollah in that area. Uh, but they can't fight or disarm uh, Hezbollah. They don't have that kind of uh, power. Uh, I'll give you a comparison, Lori. I was just told last night by uh, somebody that uh, used to live in Lebanon that for a Lebanese soldier, it's about $65, as opposed to maybe $600 or more for a, a Hezbollah soldier. So most people are joining Hezbollah. They have a lot of loyalty there in that area. And why would Hezbollah agree to leave these areas They've built a military infrastructure for decades, uh, and so this is, is unrealistic uh, diplomatic effort, it seems. We were there in 2000 when Israel pulled out of that area. We were also there in 2006 during the Second Lebanon War. Hezbollah is much, much stronger now. And on the other side of the border, Lori, Israeli families won't go back there uh, because of the danger. And uh, some people say it really condemns northern Israel. If there's no solution, military or political, to desolation. Chris, how important was this UN report on Hamas's sexual attacks on Israeli women? Well, it was very important, Laurie. And earlier today, I was at a group of uh, Christian legislators from around the world. World arrest by Israel's Minister of Intelligence, and she was just, uh, you know, documenting some of the barbaric sexual attacks on the Israeli women. I, I think finally Israel is saying that the UN is coming out with this report. It was weeks after October 7th before the UN and many international women's group really came out publicly uh, and talked about the, what what Hamas uses sexual violence in a, in a, in a wartime. And uh, there was that well-known uh, saying, you know, me too, but not if you're a Jew. So uh, I think for Israel, uh, they feel as some sort of vindication that the UN would come out with this report. Uh, and as the uh, UN ambassador, uh, the Israeli ambassador to the UN said, really, you can't deny what happened then on October 7th and what continues to happen. Uh, Lori, you know, sadly, they believe many of the Israeli women that are still in captivity are pregnant. Oh, it's just so horrible to even imagine. Well, Chris, you were at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention, and there was an important resolution discussed there. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, the resolution was actually encouraging Christian communicators to use the term Judaism the West Bank. And the reason for that is uh, the West Bank was a term that became after the 1948 war, and they designated, Jordan that is, designated the area uh, called the West Bank. Uh, and that term stayed. Uh, really, what actually is happening is that is Judea and Samaria. That is the biblical heartland of Israel. And language makes a huge difference in this narrative, uh, Lori. It's so important because when you realize that this is the land of the Bible, this is the land of Abraham uh, and the patriarchs, this is a land where Jesus was. Uh, when you think of it in that terms, uh, you see the Jewish historical and ancient connection to the land as, as, as opposed to the term West Bank, which is more of a political designation. And much of the media in the world does not use Judea and Samaria. So the whole resolution, uh, with the, the idea behind it was to recognize the biblical inheritance and the biblical connection of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. Absolutely. What a great resolution. So, Chris, there's so much going on there. What do you have today on today's episode of Jerusalem Dateline? Well, we have uh, analysis from a retired general. Uh, he's actually been advising uh, Benjamin Netanyahu during the war. Uh, he has a group of maybe 30,000 retired IDF soldiers and officers. Uh, we have analysis from him about the current state of the war. We have uh, also firsthand uh, report from a soldier from the front lines of Gaza. And we also have a report from CBN Israel. They're helping Israelis' families, and they're actually helping Ukrainians who fled from one war. They found themselves facing another war and how CBN Israel is helping them. All right, Chris Mitchell from Jerusalem, thanks as always for your insights. Stay safe and know that many people are praying for you and our staff there in Israel. Thanks, Lori. Well, you can see more from the Middle East with our CBN News team tonight on the CBN News Channel at 8 o'clock Eastern. You can also watch on the CBN News app or on YouTube. 
Coming up today is the biggest day yet in the 2024 presidential race, the Super Tuesday presidential primaries. We'll look at how the votes and the November election are shaping up when we come back. Voters in 15 states head to the ballot box in today's Super Tuesday primaries for both parties. Former President Donald Trump is looking to run up the score over opponent Nikki Haley. And despite his ongoing legal troubles, polls show he'll likely do it. CBN Washington correspondent Caitlin Burke brings us that story. We could very well win every state in record numbers. Trump has at least a 37-point lead over Haley in each of the 15 states holding primaries today, and he's already secured 244 delegates to Haley's 43. Still, experts tell CBN News there are a few states where Haley could make a good showing. We'll really be watching the northern Virginia suburbs of Washington, D.C., the Richmond suburbs, as well as some of the suburbs in Hampton Roads and the greater Virginia Beach area to see, you know, if those voters that are pro-Haley really come out and how they compete against Trump's very strong conservative rural base in Virginia. At a Texas rally Monday night, Haley said she's the only Republican who could beat President Biden. How much more losing do we have to do before we realize maybe Donald Trump is the problem? But many polls now show Trump leading Biden in a general election, and the Republican frontrunner is already campaigning as if the primary season were over. Biden's conduct on our border is by any definition a conspiracy to overthrow the United States of America. Today's primaries come after a unanimous decision from the Supreme Court forbidding states from banning Trump from the ballot. Three states, Colorado, Maine, and Illinois, ruled the former president should be barred from seeking the Republican nomination because of his actions surrounding January 6. All three citing a Civil War era insurrection clause in the 14th Amendment. But in Monday's decision, the high court said, quote, responsibility for enforcing Section 3 against federal office holders and candidates rests with Congress and not the states. While all nine justices agreed with the decision to keep Trump on the ballot, four voiced concern that the majority's opinion went too far by defining which federal actors can enforce the law. Trump, meanwhile, thanked the court and said this will be an opinion talked about for the next 100 years. You cannot take somebody out of a race. The voters can take the person out of the race very quickly, but a court shouldn't be doing that, and the Supreme Court saw that very well. It's unclear if a major defeat in today's primaries will see Haley withdrawing from the race. She has no public events scheduled for today and is expected to watch the results privately at home. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Washington. Still ahead, actor-producer Kirk Cameron is on a mission to bring wholesome books to children and we'll show you what he's up against right after this. For years, Kirk Cameron has made public libraries a focal point in his effort to make wholesome content available to kids. The actor-producer is now entering a new arena by competing against Scholastic Book Fairs, the world's largest publisher and distributor of children's books. As Charlene Aaron reports, it's a mission to ensure younger generations a better education and future. Cameron is partnering with Skytree Book Fairs, a nonprofit group aiming to equip children with books that promote positive values and lifestyles, all while respecting parents and guardians as the ultimate authority to determine what their child reads. We see that there is such a, uh, an avalanche of filth and material that's, that's twisting the minds of children about the most basic things of, rea of reality and families, gender, uh, faith, uh, what is America. Scholastic book fairs have been a longtime staple in America's public schools, and Cameron says the publisher has taken a turn by now pushing sexually explicit and other harmful content to kids. He recently highlighted one example of a book called Welcome to St. Hell, which glamorizes gender transitioning to a vulnerable audience, middle schoolers. We all grew up with Scholastic as the, as the publisher of these great books, yeah. and uh, Clifford the Big Red Dog, yeah. and Stuart Little, and James and the Giant Peach, Absolutely. and all the fun little crossword puzzles. Well, their book fairs are now filled with the kind of progressive socialist Marxist material that is undermining God, family, and the country. 
Across the country, the fight over allowing such content in schools continues. The Virginia Beach, Virginia School Board recently voted to put a committee in place to keep such content from elementary libraries. And I think we should fill our limited space in our libraries with books that are uplifting, uh, that help to develop children, and you know, and they achieve our primary task, which is to teach them to read, write, uh, understand science, uh, appreciate great literature, uh, understand history. Those books should not be harmful. As a counter, Cameron wants to provide students with better options and schools with empowering alternatives. You can replace these harmful scholastic book fairs with helpful, wholesome book fairs with 500 books that have all been vetted and screened to take out all of the nasty pornography and the critical race theory and the race stuff, and they're about wholesome, good values. Cameron says support from parents, teachers, and schools has been huge. We already have over a thousand schools, public and private, that are replacing scholastic book fairs. When we first showed up at a, a library to read one of these books with pro-God, pro-America values, uh, the leadership at the library said our people wouldn't be interested. Uh, we're more of a progressive community and we don't align with your values. Well, when we showed up, we were greeted by thousands, literally two, three thousand parents and grandparents and children coming to downtown libraries that families um, uh, deserted because of all of the violence and the crime and the rioting that was going on the last few years. Why? Because they want a, a, a resurgence of first principles mm -hmm. and the values that lead to their children's blessing and protection. As these concerned parents seek morally safe family entertainment, Cameron is also launching a new television series for kids. Our kids are having an identity crisis in our country. They don't, know, they don't know who they are. They don't know where they're going. They don't understand right from wrong or even if they're a boy or a girl. So we want to tell stories uh, that are going to give kids their identity in Christ. They're gonna teach them values. Think of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, only modernized with hilarious dialogue, okay. beautiful animation, and uh, it's called Adventures with Iggy and Mr. Kirk. I'm Mr. Kirk. I'm Mr. Kirk. And my little sidekick is an iguana named Iggy, okay. and he is being um, puppeteered by uh, a world-renowned uh, creator of puppets who worked with Jim Henson and the Muppets on Sesame Street. Adventures with Iggy and Mr. Kirk is set to air later this summer, available on YouTube, Rumble, and other streaming platforms. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Coming up, despite the bad news coming out of the southern border, border region in recent years, now the good news is being preached in that area as well. We'll have a look at Franklin Graham's evangelistic tour when we come back. Some good news from the southern border as record numbers are responding to the gospel. It's a result of a 10-city evangelistic tour by Franklin Graham that's ministering to those hit hard by the ongoing illegal immigration crisis. Heather Sells reports from one of the stops in Eagle Pass, Texas. The potential for this evangelistic tour is enormous. People of faith all along the border are looking for revival and have prepared for what it could mean. I want them to come to know that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he is Savior. But I also wanted to bring revival to the church. And it's a breath, a breath of fresh air with all the kind of negative uh, news towards, towards Eagle Pass itself. <laughs> Franklin Graham's Frontera tour is shining a spotlight on communities bearing the brunt of the border crisis, with stops from the southern tip of Texas to California. In Eagle Pass, firefighters are drained from recovering record numbers of bodies in the Rio Grande, and pastors here are well aware of the toll on state and federal agents assigned to this hotspot. Our law enforcement officials are seeing things that they've never seen before. They're seeing things they probably only read about on a daily basis, and now it affects them psychologically, it affects them emotionally. In an interview with CBN News, Graham said God prompted him to minister here. This is kind of a forgotten part of the United States. Um, it's very poor, uh, this border area. You have cartel people who take advantage and smugglers that take advantage. And you've got just good people that live here that get caught in the middle of all of this stuff. Churches in Eagle Pass, as well as other locations along the tour, have prepared for months, 
with discipleship classes and evangelism training. Churches are definitely coming together, and unity is what it's all about. That's what's going to bring the revival. I feel like God is using it to awaken people's hunger and thirst and to cause them to seek after God like never before. The ministry carries a gathering anointing, and we're believing for, for a harvest of souls to to be saved. Tonight you can be forgiven. So far, with seven of the 10 stops completed, the tour is breaking records. Graham says he has seen the highest response to the gospel invitation in these communities of any tour in the last five years. People are hungry and they're hurting and they're hungry for truth. Graham said he's also deeply concerned about the migrants and the many ways the cartels exploit them. It's, it breaks your heart when you hear some of these stories and families get separated, uh, fathers get separated, uh, the mothers get separated. Eagle Pass pastors said they would welcome opportunities to minister directly to those coming over. It's often not possible, though, as federal agents quickly process and move them out. People of this community really have no contact with these uh, immigrants that are coming through. We see them, we know they're here, we know they're passing through but it's hands off. Still, Graham is concerned about how local churches are struggling, tapped out with a national crisis in their backyard and limited resources. He is calling on larger churches in Texas to step up and help. I would hope some of these pastors would be able to come to the border and set up a sister church down here on the border and, um, and let it be a missionary church. There's a huge need. The God Loves You tour wraps up this weekend in California, but for churches all along the border, the work is just beginning as they prepare to meet with and disciple those who've made decisions for Christ. Reporting in Eagle Pass, Texas, Heather Sell, CBN News. Well, that's it for this edition of CBN Newswatch. Remember, you can find more of our news programs on the CBN News Channel anytime or online with CBNNews.com. Also, tell us what you think about the stories you've seen by emailing newswatch at CBN.com or talk to us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We hope you'll join us again next time. Have a great day.